The Story of Civilization, Volume 2, The Life of Greece, Part 2, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 7, Side 1. Greek civilization did not die with Greek freedom. On the contrary, it conquered new areas and spread in three directions as the formation of vast empires broke down the political barriers to communication, colonization, and trade. Still enterprising and alert, the Greeks moved by hundreds of thousands into Asia and Egypt, Epirus and Macedon. And not only did Ionia flower again, but Hellenic blood, language, and culture made its way into the interior of Asia Minor, into Phoenicia and Palestine, through Syria and Babylonia, across the Euphrates and the Tigris, even to Bactria and India. Never had the Greek spirit shown more zest and courage. Never had Greek letters and arts won so wide a victory. Perhaps that is why historians are wont to end their histories of Greece with Alexander. After him, the extent and complexity of the Greek world baffle any unified view or continuous narrative. There were not only three major monarchies, Macedonia, Seleucia, and Egypt, there were a hundred Greek city-states of all degrees of independence. There was a maze of alliances and leagues. There were half-Greek states in Epirus, Judea, Pergamum, Byzantium, Bithynia, Cappadocia, Galatia, Bactria. And in the west were Greek Italy and Sicily, torn between aging Carthage and youthful Rome. Alexander's rootless empire was too loosely bound together by language, communication, customs, and faith to survive him. He had left not one, but several strong men behind him, and none could be content with less than sovereignty. The size and diversity of the new realm dismissed all thought of democracy. Self-government, as the Greeks understood it, presupposed a city-state whose citizens could come periodically to a common meeting place. And besides, had not the philosophers of democratic Athens denounced democracy as the enthronement of ignorance, envy, and chaos? Alexander's successors, who were therefore termed diadochi, had been Macedonian chieftains, long accustomed to rule by the sword. Democracy, except as the occasional consultation of their aides, never entered their heads. After some minor trials at arms which disposed of lesser contenders, they divided the empire into five parts in 321, Antipater taking Macedonia and Greece, Lysimachus, Thrace, Antigonus, Asia Minor, Seleucus, Babylonia, and Ptolemy, Egypt. They did not bother to call a confirming synod of the Greek states, from that moment, except for some fitful interludes in Greece and the aristocratic Republic of Rome, monarchy ruled Europe until the French Revolution. The basic principle of democracy is freedom inviting chaos. The basic principle of monarchy is power inviting tyranny, revolution, and war. From Philip to Perseus, from Chironia to Pydna, 338 to 168, the foreign and civil wars of the city-states were supplemented by the external and internal wars of the kingdoms, for the perquisites of government tempted a hundred generals to contests for thrones. Violence was as popular, condottieri as numerous and brilliant in Hellenistic Greece as in Renaissance Italy. When Antipater died, Athens revolted again and put to death old Phocion, who had ruled it as justly as possible in Antipater's name. Cassander, Antipater's son, recaptured the city from Macedon in 318, widened the franchise to holders of a thousand drachmas, and left as his regent the philosopher, scholar, and dilettante Demetrius of Philirum, who gave the city ten years of prosperity and peace. Meanwhile, Antigonus I, or Cyclops, dreamed of uniting all of Alexander's empire under his one eye. He was defeated at Ipsus in 301 by a coalition and lost Asia Minor to Seleucus I. His son, Demetrius Polyorcetes, taker of cities, liberated Greece from Macedonian rule, gave Athens twelve years more of democracy, was lodged as the grateful city's guest in the Parthenon, brought courtesans to live with him there, drove some young men to desperation by his amorous attentions, won a brilliant naval victory over Ptolemy I at Cyprus in 308, besieged Rhodes for six years with new siege instruments but without success, made himself king of Macedon in 294, ended Athenian liberty with a garrison, fell into ever new wars, was defeated and captured by Seleucus and drank himself to death. Four years later, in 279, taking advantage of the disorder brought on by the struggle for power in the eastern Mediterranean, a horde of Celts, or Gauls, under Brennus, marched down through Macedonia into Greece. Brennus, says Pausanias, pointed out the weak state of Greece, the immense wealth of her cities, the votive offerings in the temples, the great quantities of silver and gold. At the same time, a revolution broke out in Macedonia under the leadership of Apollodorus, Part of the army joined in and helped the angry poor in their periodical revenge of despoiling the rich. The Gauls, doubtless guided by a Greek, 
found their way through secret passes around Thermopylae, killed and plundered indiscriminately, and advanced upon the rich temple at Delphi. Repulsed there by a Greek force and a storm that in Greek belief was Apollo's defense of his shrine, Brennus retreated and killed himself in shame. The surviving Gauls crossed over into Asia Minor. They butchered all the males, writes Pausanias, and likewise old women and babes at their mother's breasts. They drank the blood and feasted on the flesh of infants that were fat. High-spirited women and maidens in their flower committed suicide. Those that survived were subjected to every kind of outrage. Some of the women rushed upon the swords of the Gauls and voluntarily courted death. To others, death came from absence of food or sleep, as these merciless barbarians ravished them in turn and wreaked their lusts upon them, whether dying or dead. After years of suffering such devastation, the Greeks of Asia bought off the invaders and persuaded them to retire into northern Phrygia, where their settlements become known as Galatia, Thrace, and the Balkans. For two generations the Gauls levied fear tribute from Seleucus I and the Greek cities of the Asiatic coasts and the Black Sea. Byzantium alone paid them $240,000 a year. As the emperors and generals of Rome were to be occupied in the third century after Christ in repelling barbarian inroads, so the kings and generals of Pergamum, Seleucia, and Macedonia gave much of their resources and energies in the third century before Christ to driving back the recurring waves of Celtic invasion. Throughout its history, ancient civilization lived on the edge of a sea of barbarism that repeatedly threatened to inundate it. The stoic courage of citizens, perpetually prepared, had once kept back the peril, but stoicism was dying in Greece precisely at the time that devised its classic formulation and its name. Antigonus II, son of Demetrius Polyorcetes, called Gonatus, for reasons now unknown, drove the Gauls out of Macedonia, put down the revolt of Apollodorus, and ruled Macedonia with ability and moderation for thirty-eight years, from 277 to 239. He gave generously to literature, science, and philosophy, brought poets like Aratus of Soli to his court, and formed a lifelong friendship with Zeno the Stoic. He was the first of that very discontinuous line of philosopher kings which ended in Marcus Aurelius. Nevertheless, it was during his reign that Athens made a last bid for freedom. In 267, the Nationalist Party came into power under the leadership of a young pupil of Zeno's, Cremonides. It secured the aid of Egypt, ousted the Macedonian troops, and announced the liberation of Athens. Antigonus came down at his leisure and recaptured the city in 262, but dealt with it as became one who respected philosophy and old age. He established garrisons in the Piraeus, on Salamis, and at Sunium, and enjoined Athens from engaging in alliances or wars. For the rest, he left the city completely free. Other Greek states were solving in other ways the problem of reconciling liberty with order. About 279, little Aetolia, peopled like Macedon with half-barbarous and never-conquered mountaineers, began to organize the cities of northern Greece, chiefly those of the Delphic Amphictyony, into the Aetolian League. And about the same time, the Achaean League of Patri, Dymi, Pelini, and other towns attracted to its membership many cities of the Peloponnese. In either league, the constituent municipalities kept control of all local government, but surrendered their armed forces and foreign relations to a federal council and a strategos, elected by such of the citizens as could attend the annual assembly at Aegium and Achaea, or at Thermos in Aetolia. Each league maintained peace, and established common measures, weights, and coinages throughout its area, an achievement in cooperation that makes the third century in some ways politically superior to the age of Pericles. The Achaean League was transformed into a first-class power by Aratus of Sicyon. At the age of twenty, this new Themistocles freed Sicyon from its dictator by a night attack with a handful of men. By eloquence and subtle negotiation, he persuaded all the Peloponnesus except Sparta and Elis to join the League, which chose him as its strategos annually for ten years, from 245 to 235. With a few hundred men, he secretly entered Corinth, scaled the almost inaccessible Acrocorinthus, routed the Macedonian troops, and restored the city to freedom. Passing on to Piraeus, he bribed the Macedonian garrison to surrender and announced the liberation of Athens. From that moment to the Roman conquest, Athens enjoyed a unique self-government, Militarily powerless, but left inviolate by the Hellenistic states because her universities had made her the intellectual capital of the Greek world. Athens turned to philosophy and contentedly disappeared from political history. Now at the height of their power, the two leagues began to weaken themselves by war with each other and class war within. In 220, the Aetolian League, with Sparta and Elis, fought the bitter social war against the Achaean League and Macedon. 
Aratus, the defender of freedom, was also the protector of wealth. In each city, the League supported the party of property. The poorer citizens complained that they could not afford to attend the distant assemblies of the League and were thereby, in effect, disfranchised. They were skeptical of a liberty that meant the full privilege of the clever and the strong to exploit the simple and the weak. More and more they gave their applause to demagogues who called for a redistribution of the land. Like the rich of a century before, the poor began to favor Macedonia against their own government. Macedonia, however, was ruined by the honesty of Antigonus III. He had assumed power as regent for his stepson Philip and had promised to surrender the throne upon Philip's coming of age. The cynics of the time called him Dosan, the promiser, apparently because they took it for granted that he was lying. But he kept his word, and in 221 Philip V, aged 17, began a long reign of intrigue and war. He was a man of courage and capacity, but of unscrupulous subtlety. He seduced the wife of Aratus's son, poisoned Aratus, killed his own son on suspicion of conspiracy, and arranged banquets of poisoned wine for those who stood in the way of his plans. He enlarged and enriched Macedonia, and left it more populous and prosperous than for 150 years past. But in 215, fearful of the growing power of Rome, he made the historic mistake of allying himself with Hannibal and Carthage. A year later, Rome declared war upon Macedonia and began the conquest of Greece. 2. The Struggle for Wealth Athenaeus, who is as reliable as any gossip, tells us that Demetrius of Philirum, about 310, took a census of Athens and reported 21,000 citizens, 10,000 metics or aliens, and 400,000 slaves. The last figure is incredible, but we know nothing that contradicts it. Very probably the number of rural slaves had grown, estates were becoming larger, and were being worked more and more by slaves under a slave overseer managing for an absentee landlord. Under this system a more scientific agriculture developed. Varro knew fifty Greek manuals of the art, but the processes of erosion and deforestation had already gutted much of the land. Even in the fourth century, Plato had expressed the belief that rain and flood in the flow of time had carried away much of the arable surface of Attica. The surviving hills, in his metaphor, were a skeleton from which the flesh had been washed away. Many areas of Attica were in the third century so denuded of topsoil that their ancient farms were abandoned. The forests of Greece were vanishing, and timber, like food, had to be brought in from abroad. The mines at Lorium were worn out and almost deserted, silver could be gotten more cheaply from Spain, and the gold mines of Thrace, which had once poured their wealth into Athens, now enriched the treasury and beautified the coinage of Macedon. While the source of a virile and independent citizenry was drying up in the villages, industry and the class war were progressing in the towns. Small factories and the slaves in them were growing in number at Athens, as in all the larger cities of the Hellenistic world. Slave dealers accompanied the armies, bought unransomed captives and sold them at three or four minas, or one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars, ahead in the great slave markets of Delos and Rhodes. Some scruples, moral or economic, were felt about this ancient institution. A humanitarian sentiment arose as a byproduct of philosophy. The cosmopolitan spirit of the age was negligent of racial distinctions, and casual hired labor, which could be thrown upon public relief whenever it ceased to be privately profitable, was in many circumstances cheaper than slave labor that had to be continuously maintained. Towards the close of this period there was a substantial rise in manumissions. Commerce languished in the older cities but flourished in the new. The Greek ports of Asia and Egypt grew at the expense of the Piraeus, and even on the mainland it was Chalcis and Corinth that caught the swelling currents of Hellenistic trade. Through these strategically situated and well-equipped centers, as through Antioch, Seleucia, Rhodes, Alexandria, and Syracuse, a busy stream of merchants flowed, spreading a cosmopolitan and skeptical point of view. Bankers multiplied and lent not only to traders and proprietors, but to cities and governments. Some cities, like Delos and Byzantium, had public or national banks holding government funds and managed by state officials. In 324, Antimenes of Rhodes organized the first known system of insurance by guaranteeing owners for a premium of 8% against loss from the flight of their slaves. The release of Persian accumulations and the quickened circulation of capital reduced the rate of interest to 10% in the 3rd century and 7% in the 2nd. Speculation was widespread but not organized. Some manipulators sought to raise prices by limiting production. There were advocates of restricting crops to keep up the purchasing power of the farming community. Prices in general were high, again because of the Achaemenid treasuries that Alexander had poured into the currency of the world, but at the same time, and partly by the same cause, trade was facilitated, production was stimulated, and prices gradually fell back to a normal range. 
The wealth of the wealthy grew beyond any precedent in Greek history. Homes became palaces, furniture and carriages more sumptuous, servants more numerous. Dinners became orgies, and women became show windows of their husbands' prosperity. Wages lagged behind rising prices and rapidly followed their fall. They could support a single man only and made for celibacy, pauperism, and depopulation. They left a diminishing economic distance between free worker and slave. Employment was irregular, and thousands of men abandoned the mainland cities for mercenary soldiering abroad or to hide their poverty in rural isolation. The Athenian government relieved the destitute with grants of corn. The rich amused them with free tickets to celebrations and games. The wealthy stinted in wages but were generous in charity. Often they lent money to, to their cities without interest or rescued them from bankruptcy with large gifts or built public works out of their private funds or endowed temples or universities or paid handsomely for the statues or the poems that published their features or their, their largesse. The poor organized themselves into unions for mutual aid, but they could do little against the power and cleverness of the rich, the conservatism of the peasants, and the readiness of otherwise rival governments and leagues to exchange armed assistance in suppressing revolts. The freedom of unequal ability to accumulate or starve brought on again, as in Solon's days, an extreme concentration of wealth. The poor lent readier ear to socialistic gospels. Their spokesmen called for the cancellation of debts, the redivision of the land, and the confiscation of large fortunes. The boldest now and then proposed the liberation of the slaves. The decay of religious belief promoted the growth of compensatory utopias. Zeno the Stoic described an ideal communism in his Republic, circa 300, and his follower Iambulus, circa 250, inspired Greek rebels with a romance in which he described a blessed isle in the Indian Ocean, perhaps Ceylon. There, he reported, all men were equal, not only in rights, but in ability and intelligence. All worked equally and shared equally in the product. All took equal part, turn by turn, in administering the government. Neither wealth nor poverty existed there, nor any war of the classes. Nature produced fruit abundantly of her own accord, and men lived in harmony and universal love. Some governments nationalized certain industries. Bryini took over the salt works, Miletus the textile factories, Rhodes and Nidus the potteries but the governments paid as low wages as the private employer and squeezed all possible profit from the labor of their slaves. The gulf between rich and poor widened. The class war became bitterer than before. Every city, young or old, echoed with the hatred of class for class, with uprisings, massacres, suppressions, banishments, and the destruction of property and life. When one faction won, it exiled the other and confiscated its goods. When the exiles returned to power, they revenged themselves in kind and slaughtered their enemies. Imagine the stability of an economic system subject to such decerebrations and disturbances. Some ancient Greek cities were so devastated by class strife that industry and men fled from them. Grass grew in the streets. Cattle came there to graze. Polybius, writing about 150, describes certain timeless phases of the war from the viewpoint of a rich conservative. When they, the radical leaders, have made the populace ready and greedy to receive bribes, the virtue of democracy is destroyed, and it is transformed into a government of violence and the strong hand. For the mob, habituated to feed at the expense of others and to have its hopes of a livelihood in the property of its neighbors, as soon as it has found a leader sufficiently ambitious and daring, produces a reign of violence. Then come tumultuous assemblies, massacres, banishments, redivisions of land. It was war and class war that weakened mainland Greece to the point of being easily overcome by Rome. The bitter ruthlessness of the victors, the destruction of crops, vineyards and orchards, the raising of farmhouses, the selling of captives into slavery, ruined one locality after another and left an empty shell for the ultimate enemy. A land so wasted by strife, by erosion, deforestation and the listless tillage of impoverished tenants or slaves could not compete with the alluvial plains of the Orontes, the Euphrates, the Tigris and the Nile. The northern cities were no longer on the great routes of trade. They had lost their navies and could not control the sources and avenues of the grain supply that Athens and Sparta had mastered in their imperial days. The centers of power, even of literary and artistic creation, passed back again to Asia and Egypt, from which, a thousand years before, Greece had humbly learned her letters and her arts. 3. The Morals of Decay the failure of the city-state accelerated the decay of the orthodox religion. The gods of the city had proved helpless to defend it and had forfeited belief. The population was intermingled with foreign merchants who had no share in the city's civic or religious life and whose amused skepticism spread among the citizens. The mythology of the ancient local gods survived among the peasantry and the simple townsfolk and in the official rites. The educated used it for poetry and art, 
the half liberated attacked it bitterly, the upper classes supported it as an aid to order and discountenanced open atheism as bad taste. The growth of large states brought on a simpolity of the gods and made for a vague monotheism, while philosophers strove to formulate pantheism for the literate in a manner not too obviously incompatible with orthodox belief. About 300, Euhemerus of Masana in Sicily published his Hiera Anagrapha, literally holy scriptures or records, in which he argued that the gods were either personified powers of nature or more often human heroes deified by popular imagination or gratitude for their benefits to mankind, that myths were allegories and that religious ceremonies were originally exercises in commemoration of the dead. So Zeus was a conqueror who had died in Crete, Aphrodite was the founder and patroness of prostitution, and the story of Cronus eating his children was only a way of saying that cannibalism had once existed on the earth. The book had a sharply atheistic effect in third century Greece. Skepticism, however, is uncomfortable. It leaves the common heart and imagination empty, and the vacuum soon draws in some new and encouraging creed. The victories of philosophy and Alexander cleared the way for novel cults. Athens in the third century was so disturbed by exotic faiths, nearly all of them promising heaven and threatening hell, that Epicurus, like Lucretius in first century Rome, felt called upon to denounce religion as hostile to peace of mind and joy of life. The new temples, even in Athens, were now usually dedicated to Isis, Serapis, Bendis, Adonis, or some other alien deity. The Eleusinian mysteries flourished and were imitated in Egypt, Italy, Sicily, and Crete. Dionysus Eleutherios, the liberator, remained popular until he was absorbed into Christ. Orphism won fresh devotees as it renewed contact with the Eastern faiths from which it had sprung. The old religion had been aristocratic and had excluded foreigners and slaves. The new Oriental cults accepted all men and women, alien or bond or free, and held out to all classes the promise of eternal life. Superstition spread while science reached its apogee. Theophrastus' portrait of the superstitious man reveals how frail was the film of culture even in the capital of enlightenment and philosophy. The number seven was unspeakably holy. There were seven planets, seven days of the week, seven wonders, seven ages of man, seven heavens, seven gates of hell. Astrology was rejuvenated by commerce with Babylonia. People took it for granted that the stars were gods who ruled in detail the destinies of individuals and states. Character, even thought, was determined by the star or planet under which one had been born, and would therefore be jovial, or mercurial, or saturnine. Even the Jews, the least superstitious of all peoples, expressed good wishes by saying, Mazel tov, may your planet be favorable. Astronomy fought for its life against astrology, but finally succumbed in the second century A.D., and everywhere the Hellenistic world worshipped Tyche, the great god Chance. Only an act of persistent imagination or a gift for observation can enable us to realize what it means to a nation to have its traditional religion die. Classic Greek civilization had been built upon a patriotic devotion to the city-state, and classic morality, though rooted in folkways rather than in faith, had been powerfully reinforced by supernatural belief. But now neither faith nor patriotism survived in the educated Greek. Civic frontiers had been erased by empires, and the growth of knowledge had secularized morals, marriage, parentage, and law. For a time, the Periclean Enlightenment helped morality, as in modern Europe. Humanitarian feelings were developed and aroused, ineffectually, a keener resentment against war. Arbitration grew among cities and men. Manners were more polished, argument more urbane. Courtesy trickled down, as in our Middle Ages, from the courts of the kings, where it was a matter of personal safety and royal prestige. When the Romans came, Greece was amazed at their bad manners and blunt ways. Life was more refined, women moved about in it more freely, and stimulated the males to unwanted elegance. Men shaved now, especially in Byzantium and Rhodes, where the laws forbade it as effeminate. But the pursuit of pleasure consumed the adult life of the upper classes. The old problem of ethics and morals, to reconcile the natural epicureanism of the individual with the necessary stoicism of the state, found no solution in religion, statesmanship, or philosophy. Education spread, but spread thin. As in all intellectual ages, it stressed knowledge more than character and produced masses of half-educated people who, uprooted from labor and the land, moved about in unplaced discontent like loosened cargo in the ship of state. Some cities, like Miletus and Rhodes, established public, that is, government-supported, schools. At Tios and Chios, boys and girls were educated together with an impartiality that only Sparta had shown. The gymnasium developed into a high school or college with classrooms, lecture hall, and library. The palestra flourished and proved popular in the East. 
but public games had degenerated into professional contests, chiefly boxing, in which strength counted for more than skill. The Greeks, who had once been a nation of athletes, became now a nation of spectators, content to witness rather than to do. Sexual morality was relaxed even beyond the loose standards of the Periclean age. Homosexualism remained popular. The youth Delphus is in love, says Theocritus's Semitha, but whether for a woman or a man I cannot say. The courtesan still reigned. Demetrius Polyrocetes levied a tax of 250 talents, or $750,000, upon the Athenians, and then gave it to his mistress Lamia on the ground that she needed it for soap, which led the angry Athenians to remark how unclean the lady must be. Dances of naked women were accepted as part of the mores and were performed before a Macedonian king. Athenian life was portrayed in Menander's plays as a round of triviality, seduction, and adultery. Greek women participated actively in the cultural pursuits of the time and contributed to letters, science, philosophy, and art. Aristodema of Smyrna gave recitals of her poetry throughout Greece and received many honors. Some philosophers, like Epicurus, did not hesitate to admit women into their schools. Literature began to stress the physical loveliness of woman rather than her worth and charm as a mother. The literary cult of feminine beauty arose in this period alongside the poetry and fiction of romantic love. The partial emancipation of woman was accompanied by a revolt against wholesale maternity, and the limitation of the family became the outstanding social phenomenon of the age. Abortion was punishable only if practiced by a woman against the wish of her husband or at the instigation of her seducer. When a child came, it was in many cases exposed. Only one family in a hundred in the old Greek cities reared more than one daughter. Even a rich man, reports Posidippus, always exposes a daughter. Sisters were a rarity. Families with no child or only one were numerous. Inscriptions enable us to trace the fertility of 79 families in Miletus about 200 B.C. 32 had one child, 31 had two. Altogether they had 118 sons and 28 daughters. At Eritrea only one family in 12 had two sons. Hardly any had two daughters. Philosophers condoned infanticide as reducing the pressure of population, but when the lower classes took up the practice on a large scale, the death rate overtook the birth rate. Religion, which had once frightened men into fertility lest their dead souls be untended, no longer had the power to outweigh considerations of comfort and cost. In the colonies, immigration replaced the old families. In Attica and the Peloponnesus, immigration trickled down to a negligible figure, and population declined. In Macedonia, Philip V forbade the limitation of the family, and in thirty years raised the manpower of the country fifty percent. We may judge from this how widespread the practice of limitation had become, even in half-primitive Macedon. In our time, wrote Polybius about 150 B.C., the whole of Greece has been subject to a low birth rate and a general decrease of the population, owing to which cities have become deserted and the land has ceased to yield fruit. For as men had fallen into such a state of luxury, avarice, and indolence that they did not wish to marry, or if they married, to rear the children born to them, or at most but one or two of them, so as to leave these in affluence and bring them up to waste their substance, the evil insensibly but rapidly grew. For in cases where of one or two children the one was carried off by war and the other by sickness, it was evident that the houses must have been left empty, and by small degrees cities became resourceless and feeble. 4. Revolution in Sparta Meanwhile that concentration of wealth, which everywhere in Greece was inflaming the eternal conflict of classes, produced in Sparta two attempts at revolutionary reform. Isolated by its mountain barriers, Sparta had maintained its independence, had fought back the Macedonians, and had bravely defeated the immense army of Pyrrhus in 272. But the greed of the strong generated from within the ruin that enemy forces had failed to bring from without. The Lycurgian laws against alienating the land from the family by sale or dividing it in bequests had been abrogated, and the fortunes made by Spartans in empire or war had gone to buying up the soil. By 244, the 700,000 acres of Laconia were owned by 100 families, and only 700 men had preserved the rights of citizenship. Even these no longer ate in common. The poor could not make the necessary contribution, while the rich preferred to feast in private. A large majority of the families that had once enjoyed the franchise had sunk into poverty and called for a cancellation of debts and a redivision of the land. It is to the credit of monarchy that the attempt to reform this condition came from the Spartan kings. In 242, Agis IV and Leonidas succeeded to the dual throne. 
Convinced that Lycurgus had meant the land to be equally divided among all freemen, Agis proposed to redistribute it, to annul all debts, and to restore the semi-communism of Lycurgus. Those landowners whose property was mortgaged supported the move for cancellation, but when the measure had been passed, they resisted violently the remaining elements of Agis's reforms. At the instigation of Leonidas, Agis was murdered, along with his mother and his grandmother, both of whom had volunteered to surrender their great estates for division among the people. In this royal drama, the noblest characters were women. Pylonus, daughter of Leonidas, was the wife of Cleombrotus, who supported Agis. When Leonidas was exiled and Cleombrotus seized his throne, Chilonus left her triumphant husband to share her father's banishment. When Leonidas recaptured power and exiled Cleombrotus, Chilonus chose exile with her husband. Leonidas, to get the rich property of Agis's widow into his family, compelled her to marry his son Cleomenes. But Cleomenes fell in love with his wife and imbibed from her the ideas of the dead king. When he came to the throne as Cleomenes III, he resolved to carry out Agis's reforms. Having won over the army by his courage in war and the people by the simplicity of his life, he abolished the oligarchic effort on the ground that Lycurgus had never sanctioned it. He killed fourteen resistors, exiled eighty, cancelled all debts, divided the land among the free population, and restored the Lycurgian discipline. Not content, he set out to conquer the Peloponnese for the revolution. The proletariat everywhere hailed him as a liberator, and many towns surrendered to him gladly. He took Argos, Bellini, Phlius, Epidaurus, Hermione, Treason, at last even rich Corinth. The ferment of his program spread. In Boeotia, the payment of debts was abandoned, and the state appropriated funds to appease the poor. In Megalopolis, the philosopher Cersidus pled with the rich to aid the needy before revolution destroyed all wealth. When Cleomenes invaded Achaea and defeated Aratus, all upper-class Greece trembled for its property. Aratus appealed to Macedonia. Antigonus Doson came down, overwhelmed Cleomenes at Salassia in 221, and restored the oligarchic regime to Lacedaemon. Cleomenes fled to Egypt, tried and failed to win the help of Ptolemy III, tried and failed to rouse the Alexandrians to revolution, and killed himself. The class war continued. A generation after Cleomenes, the people of Sparta overthrew the government and set up a revolutionary dictatorship. Philopemon, who had succeeded Aratus as head of the Achaean League, invaded Laconia and restored the rule of property. As soon as Philopemon had gone, the people rose again and set up Nabus as dictator in 207. Nabus was a Syrian Semite who had been captured in war and sold into slavery at Megalopolis. Smarting under suppressed ability, he had revenged himself by organizing a revolt among the Helots. Now he gave Spartan citizenship to all freemen and freed all the Helots with one word. When the rich obstructed him, he confiscated their wealth and cut off their heads. The news of his doings went abroad, and he found it a simple matter, with the help of the poorer classes, to conquer Argos, Messenia, Elis, and part of Arcadia. Everywhere he nationalized large estates, redistributed the land, and abolished debts. The Achaean League, unable to overthrow him, appealed to Rome for aid. Flamininus came, but Nabus offered so resolute a resistance that the Roman accepted a truce by which Nabus was to release the imprisoned rich, but would retain his power. At this juncture, Nabus was assassinated by an agent of the Aetolian League in 192. Four years later, Philippemon marched in again, propped up the oligarchs, abolished the Lycurgian regimen, and sold 3,000 of Nabus's followers into slavery. The revolution was ended, but so was Sparta. It continued to exist, but it played no further part in the history of Greece. 5. The Ascendancy of Rhodes Frightened by the violence of faction and drawn by the movements of population, trade and capital passed from the mainland and sought new havens in the Aegean. Delos, once rich through Apollo, flourished in the second century as a free port under the protection of Rome and the management of Athens. The little isle was crowded with alien merchants, business offices, palaces and hovels, and the diverse temples of exotic faiths. Rhodes reached her zenith in the third century and was then by common consent the most civilized and beautiful city in Hellas. Strabo described the great port as so far superior to all others in harbors, roads, walls, and improvements that I am unable to speak of any other city as equal to it or even as almost equal to it. Situated at one of the crossroads of the Mediterranean, in a position to take advantage of that expanding trade which Alexander's conquests had made possible between Europe, Egypt, and Asia, 
Rhodes's spacious harbors replaced Tyre and the Piraeus as a port of reshipment for goods and as a clearinghouse for the organization and financing of commerce in the Eastern Sea. Her merchants established a profitable reputation for honesty, her banks and her government for stability, in a world of treachery and change. Her powerful fleet, manned by her citizens, cleared the Aegean of pirates, maintained an equal security for the merchant vessels of all nations, and established a code of maritime law so ably devised and so widely accepted that it governed Mediterranean trade for centuries and passed down into the marine law of Rome, Constantinople, and Venice. Having freed herself from Macedonian domination by her heroic resistance to Demetrius Polyarsites in 305, Rhodes steered successfully through the untroubled politics of the age by maintaining a wise neutrality or by going to war only to check the growth of an aggressor state or to preserve the freedom of the seas. She united many of the Aegean cities in an island league and exercised her presidency so fairly that no one questioned her right to lead. Her government, an aristocracy resting on a democratic base as in Republican Rome, ruled the sinicized cities of Lindus, Camirus, Yalysis, and Rhodes with skill and comparative justice, gave to alien residents such privileges as Athens had never yielded to her metics, protected a large population of slaves so well that when in danger it dared to arm them, and laid upon the rich men of the city the obligation to take care of the poor. The state met its expenses by a 2% tax upon imports and exports. It lent money generously, sometimes without interest, to cities in distress. When Rhodes herself was physically ruined by an earthquake in 225, all the Greek world came to her aid, for everyone recognized that her disappearance from the Aegean would lead to commercial and financial chaos. Iron II sent 100 gold talents, or $300,000, and set up in the restored city a statuary group showing the people of Rhodes being crowned by the people of Syracuse. Ptolemy III sent 300 talents of silver, Antigonus III sent 3,000, together with great quantities of timber and pitch for building. His queen, Chryseis, gave 3,000 talents of lead and 150,000 bushels of corn. Seleucus III sent 300,000 bushels of corn and ten fully equipped quinquireems. As for the towns that contributed each according to its means, says Polybius, it would be difficult to enumerate them. It was a bright interlude in the dark annals of political history, one of the rare occasions when all the Greek world thought and acted as one. Chapter 24. Hellenism and the Orient. 1. The Seleucid Empire. As we move from the mainland through the Aegean into the Greek settlements in Asia and Egypt, we are surprised to find a fresh and flourishing life, and we perceive that the Hellenistic age saw not so much the decay as the dissemination of Greek civilization. From the end of the Peloponnesian War, a stream of Greek soldiers and immigrants had entered Asia. Alexander's conquests widened this stream by offering new opportunities and avenues to Hellenic enterprise. Seleucus, called Nicator, or Victor, was distinguished among Alexander's generals as a man of courage, imagination, and un unscrupulous generosity. It was characteristic of him that he gave his second wife, the beautiful Stratonice, to his son Demetrius when he learned that the boy was pining away for love of her. Antigonus I, challenging the allotment of Babylonia to Seleucus, set out to conquer for himself all the Near East. Seleucus and Ptolemy I defeated him at Gaza in 312. From that moment the house of Seleucus dated the Seleucid Empire and a new era, a mode of reckoning that survived in Western Asia till Mohammed. Seleucus united under his scepter the old kingdoms and cultures of Elam, Sumeria, Persia, Babylonia, Assyria, Syria, Phoenicia, and at times Asia Minor and Palestine. At Seleucia and Antioch he built capitals richer and more populous than any ever known in mainland Greece. For Seleucia he chose a site near the aged Babylon and the future Baghdad, almost at the junction of the Euphrates and the Tigris. It was conveniently located to attract commerce between Mesopotamia and the Persian Gulf and beyond. Within half a century it had a population of 600,000 souls, a motley mass of Asiatics dominated by a minority of Greeks. Antioch was similarly situated on the Orontes, not too far from its mouth to be reached by ocean shipping, yet sufficiently inland to be safe from naval attack, to tap the fertile fields of the river valley, and to draw the Mediterranean trade of northern Mesopotamia and Syria. Here the later Seleucid emperors established their residence, until under Antiochus IV it became the wealthiest city of Seleucidasia, adorned with temples, porticos, theaters, gymnasiums, palestras, 
flower gardens, landscaped boulevards, and parks so beautiful that the Garden of Daphne was known throughout Greece for its laurels and cypresses, its fountains and streams. Seleucus I was assassinated in 281 after 35 years of beneficent and popular rule. From his death, his empire began to disintegrate, torn with geographical and racial divisions, violent struggles for the throne, and barbarian invasions on every side. Antiochus I, Soter, or Savior, fought gallantly against the Gauls. Antiochus II, Theos, the god, lived in a perpetual intoxication, as if again to illustrate the gamble of hereditary monarchy. His wife, Laodice, began that chain of intrigue which disrupted and finally ruined the royal house. Antiochus III, the Great, was a man of capacity and culture. His bust in the Louvre shows a Greco-Macedonian with the courage of Macedon and the intelligence of Greece. He recaptured by untiring war most of the territory which the empire had lost since Seleucus I. He established a library at Antioch and promoted the literary movement that culminated in Meliager of Gaza at the close of the second century. He preserved the Greek custom of municipal autonomy, writing to the cities that if he should order anything contrary to the laws, they should pay no attention but assume that he had acted in ignorance. He was ruined by ambition, imagination, and a flair for love. In 217 he was defeated by Ptolemy IV at Raphia and lost Phoenicia, Syria, and Palestine. He consoled himself by a victorious expedition into Bactria and India in 208, duplicating the exploits of Alexander. Lured by Hannibal into helping him against Rome, he landed an army in Euboea, fell in love at fifty with a pretty maid of Chalcis, courted her honorably, married her elaborately, forgot the war, and spent the winter enjoying his happiness. The Romans defeated him at Thermopylae, drove him into Asia Minor, and overwhelmed him at Magnesia. Restless, he plunged into another eastern campaign and died in its course in 187 after a reign of thirty-six years. His son, Seleucus IV, loved peace, administered the empire with economy and wisdom, and was assassinated in 175. At that time, his younger brother was serving as archon at Athens, where he had gone to study philosophy. Hearing of Seleucus's death, he organized an army, marched to Antioch, deposed the assassin, and took the throne in 175. Antiochus IV was both the most interesting and the most erratic of his line, a rare mixture of intellect, insanity, and charm. He governed his kingdom ably, despite a thousand injustices and absurdities. He allowed his delegates to abuse their power, and gave his mistress authority over three cities. He was generous and cruel without judgment, often forgiving or condemning by whim, surprising simple folk with costly gifts, and tossing money with a child's ecstasy among the crowds in the street. He loved wine, women, and art. He drank to excess, and left his royal seat at banquets to dance naked with the entertainers, or to carouse with wastrels. He was a bohemian whose dream of power had come true. He despised the solemnity and trappings of the court, played practical jokes upon his dignitaries, and disguised himself to know the luxury of anonymity. It delighted him to mingle with the people and overhear their comments on the king. He liked to wander among the shops of the artisans, watching and studying the work of engravers and jewelers, and discussing with them the technical details of their craft. He felt a sincere enthusiasm for Greek art, literature, and thought. He made Antioch for a century the art center of the Greek world. He paid artists handsomely to set up statuary and temples in other cities of Hellas. He redecorated the shrine of Apollo at Delos, built a theater for Tegea, and financed the completion of the Olympium at Athens. Having lived fourteen impressionable years in Rome, he had imbibed a taste for republican institutions, and as if to foreshadow Augustus, it pleased his humor and policy to clothe his monarchical power in the forms of republican freedom. The chief effect of his passion for things Roman was the introduction of gladiatorial games in Antioch, his capital. The people resented the brutal sport, but Antiochus won them over by lavish and spectacular displays. When they became accustomed to the butchery, he considered their degeneration a personal victory. It was characteristic of him that he began as an ardent follower of the Stoics and ended as an easy convert to the Epicureans. He enjoyed his own qualities so keenly that he labeled his coins Antiochus Theos Epiphanes, the god made manifest. Overreaching himself in the manner of his imaginative kind, he attempted in 169 to conquer Egypt. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.